Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History, here to welcome you. As a reminder, before we start, all recent past and future First Wednesday online lectures are, are available on our Friends of History webpage, friendsofhistorynm.org. Just click on the lecture series link at the top of the homepage. Our monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with the support of the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations. These funds will directly go to support the lecture series and more importantly, all history museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make a donation, just go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Today, we are happy to welcome Scott Andrews, the founder of the Wisdom Archive. Scott first came to Santa Fe in 1978 as a student at the Anthropology Film Center. It was the second year of a master's degree in visual anthropology, which launched him on a career producing cross-cultural documentaries for public television around the world. After gaining a PhD in education at Stanford, he went on to win an Emmy for his work in Afghanistan, Last Images of War, and a DuPont Silver Baton for a three-part frontline series about integration at Berkeley, California's high school, School of Colors. He returned to live in Santa Fe in 2013 and began filming with local traditional masters for the Wisdom Archive. Today, after providing an introduction on the aims of the Wisdom Archive, Scott will share three brief selections from the video collection. Following the presentation, Scott will answer any questions you may have. Your questions and comments can be posted at any time uh, in the YouTube chat room, both during and after the presentation. So let us now welcome Scott Andrews. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Scott Andrews, and I'm the founder of the Wisdom Archive, which is a 501c3 that was established here in Santa Fe in 2014. Uh, our purpose is to make a video archive, a visual archive of disappearing traditional knowledge. Uh, and as we're based in Santa Fe, uh, most of our work is in northern New Mexico. So right now, the archive has uh, 51 films. 41 are about traditional, disappearing traditional life of northern New Mexico. 10 are from other countries, from traditional societies in other countries. Uh, and the whole idea kind of came about because there's a, a focus right now on disappearing biodiversity. And the loss of, in our minds, the loss of cultural diversity is equally tragic and equally important to be noted and, and, and paid some attention to, and we're paying attention to it by trying to find elders who may be the last who know their particular knowledge, traditional knowledge, and especially knowledge which is practical knowledge. The great thing about film uh, as a recording medium is, it, is you can show how to do something. So our focus is not on oral history, or oral traditions. It's really on things that people know how to do that they can show how to do, that they are their elders, but they can still do it. They are still doing it. They are still practicing their art or their craft. And so those are the people we look for. Uh, and we try and find people who, if possible, have younger people in their family or their community who they are teaching their craft to. And we try and include that in the film because we feel that the transfer of culture is super important. Uh, and that's obviously the idea of the Wisdom Archive. Our, our subtitle is the seed bank of traditional culture. The idea being that, you know, 50, 100, 75 years down the road, when somebody from one of these cultures or, or from an entirely different culture wants to learn how to, let's say, die, traditionally dye wool, uh, they can watch Rita Padilla Hoffman's film on the Wisdom Archive and learn how to do that, see how to do it without uh, having that lost when that person passes. And, you know, that's the, the sad part. And, and the important part is to do 
as many of these as possible as soon as possible because uh, here in northern New Mexico, like in much of the world, these traditional elders are passing, especially in the time of COVID. We've lost so much knowledge, so much cultural knowledge with these elders who have passed with COVID. And they have been unable in many cases to leave a record of that. I think the uh, local uh, Native American Pueblo people are very good with oral tradition and, and uh, have a vibrant society. So perhaps it's less necessary for people who still have a vibrant culture with oral traditions and passing down of traditional knowledge. But many cultures don't have that uh, that's still intact. And so to record this now and put it in an archive where it's universally accessible, which is one of the great things about YouTube. YouTube, number one, it's free. Uh, it's accessible anywhere in the world. And uh, you know, one of the things we're also trying to do is liberate some films and footage from archives where it is not visible. There's a lot of great old material which is around, but people can't see it because it's often held in state archives or museum archives, or it's in a format uh, which is not digitized, uh, and so it's difficult for people to see. But it represents a body of knowledge which is locked away, and to the degree that we can raise funding to liberate that, that's another thing that we try and do. Besides film with elders who are still alive is find films or footage from elders who are no longer with us and figure out a way to make that visible and accessible via YouTube. Uh, so as I was saying to this date, most of our work has been in Northern New Mexico. Uh, there's two other local filmmakers, Chris Beaver, who is a longtime documentarian and Lucia Duncan. Uh, and both of them have pieces, are, are, the work that is visible at the moment, besides on the Wisdom Archive, is there is an ongoing exhibit at the Museum of International Folk Art that was curated by Nicolás Chávez and Cipriano Vigil uh, called uh, Musica Buena. And there are 13 video pieces in that exhibit. And those were all produced either by myself or by Chris or by Lucia uh, for the exhibit. And those are mostly about uh, traditional forms of music in New Mexico, some of which we had already recorded, recorded, and some which were recorded specifically for the exhibit. So a lot of the music that we use to go with other films uh, also on the Wisdom Archive is from traditional sources, and we really have a big debt to Antonia Podaca, Cipriano Vigil, and then the local group who is helping keep these musical traditions alive, Lon Pignon, which is run by or, or led by Jordan Wax, uh, an incredible musician here in Santa Fe. So we really want to thank them for their um, generosity with their music and also thank all the people in all our films for their generosity because, uh, you know, many times they're sharing knowledge which, uh, you know, could be hoarded. People could say, you know, I learned this from my grandmother and I don't want to share it. But these people are being very generous. And, you know, the film that has been seen the most um, is actually uh, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio Manzanares' mother, Natividad. So that's Antonio back there. That's the film called The Last Shepherds. Uh, Antonio and Molly Manzanares have one of the last big flocks of sheep up in Tierra Maria. And his mom uh, very graciously agreed to demonstrate and give her recipe for bizcochitos, which has been passed down for generations and now has about 90,000 views. Um, and so that's the other thing I think it's important to say. Nobody gets paid to be in our films. They're all um, donating their time, their energy, and their knowledge. And so we're really appreciative of that. And uh, so we have these 41 films. They fall into kind of different categories. One is about traditional farming in New Mexico. And there's two year in the life films uh, that we did. One is uh, The Last Shepherds, where we follow a year in the life of a traditional uh, sheep farming operation up in Tierra Maria. And then there is La Huerta de Don Bustos, which is about Don Bustos, who is a farmer in Santa Cruz, who still lives and farms the land that's been in his family for 400 years and tends the acequias and uh, knows when to plant based upon uh, knowledge that goes back hundreds of years. Uh, and then we also have um, a, a rancher in uh, Truchas, Eugencio Lopez, who's also a Santero. And we have a short piece on him. Um, so those are 
kind of about traditional farming. And then we have traditional music. Uh, and I, again, the kind of the centerpiece of that is, uh, is a piece that we did with uh, Antonio Apodaca and Cipriano Vigil. They knew each other for a long time. Uh, Antonio was maybe half a generation or a generation older than Cipriano. So they knew each other. They had never played together. We got them together and they spend 40 minutes teaching each other songs and having a ball. So it's a wonderful piece. And Antonio Apodaca is no longer with us. So uh, we're so thankful that uh, we have that to share uh, now. And then there's also uh, music from Lompignon. And there's a, a piece on Cipriano about his life uh, and his work teaching uh, traditional music to school children in New Mexico. And then we have uh, the Musica Buena exhibit, which I mentioned earlier at the Museum of International Folk Art. And that includes uh, three very important pieces called entregas, uh, very important in the history of Spanish colonial society in Northern New Mexico. And in the absence of uh, priests in the early history of this area, often the local musician would sing these entregas as a way of formalizing relationships in the eyes of the village before the priest could come. So it might be a marriage. So one of the entregas is the entrega de los novios. Another entrega is the entrega de bautismo, uh, which is the baptism. And the whole purpose of that was the priest might only come once a year. And prior to the priest coming, if a child died and had not been baptized, people feared that it might go to hell. So the whole purpose of having this unofficial baptism via music was to save that child. And then the third one is the Entrega del Defunto, which is a, an alabado that would be sung by the Penitente Brothers of Amorada at a funeral. Uh, and that was uh, very kindly performed by Charlie Carrillo, who is the mayor, uh, hermano mayor of the uh, Morada in Abiquiu. Uh, and then we also have in there, we have one of the pieces that we created from uh, footage that was created by the Luhan family in Chamayo back in the 70s, it was the last place where the uh, passion play of Moros and Cristianos was performed. So we had some old Super 8 footage and some audio, and we put together a film uh, based on that footage uh, of something that disappeared in the 70s. There's also a film about, um, uh, let me see, where are we? Excuse me, well, there's a lot of films. So Los Pastores, so Los Pastores was last performed in 1995 in Trampas, and it was uh, performed by the, by the uh, work of Arsenio Cordova and Larry Torres. Uh, and it was filmed at that time, and it's a film that is in circulation, but rarely seen. So for the exhibit, we also cut that down and made that accessible. Then we have a whole series on traditional food, cooking, and herbs of New Mexico. Uh, and I already mentioned the one about bizcochitos with Natividad Manzanares. There's also several films with uh, Camila um, Trujillo, who uh, shows how to uh, collect herbs. She's a herbera, a traditional herbera, how to collect herbs in the fall, in the spring, and then how to make an herbal muscle balm with those. And she also shares her passed down recipes from her grandmother and her great -grand grandmother for uh, red chili sauce, uh, frijoles, and atole. And she and Don Bustos of uh, La Huerta de Don Bustos also show how to make uh, ristras, uh, which is also something which is passing from the general knowledge, how to actually take the chilies and tie them. Uh, and then there's a piece that we did at uh, Las Golondrinas called La Truchas Mill. It's the last operating Spanish colonial flour mill in New Mexico that operates once a year. So we made a short film showing how that, how that works. And then we have a whole section on traditional art of New Mexico. And so there's a piece with Rita Padilla Hoffman, who's a well-known weaver. And she shows how to dye, spin, card, uh, wool uh, from churro and uh, mostly from churro sheep, which are the traditional sheep which are brought here by the Spanish. Uh, and then there's a piece, uh, Recuerdo, by Chris Beaver, which is about 
Nicholas Herrera, who's a well-known Santero in El Rito. Uh, and then the, the pieces that started all are my neighbor across the street was Monica Sosaya, who was widely known as kind of the grand dame of Spanish market. And she was a culture artist and also a Santera who painted uh, Matachinas on Hyde. Uh, so there's two films with, with, uh, on, uh, with uh, Monica. Uh, and then uh, two recently finished films. Uh, there's one with uh, Diana Lujan and her daughter, Lenise, and her granddaughter, Hannah, three generations doing straw applique. Uh, and they're artists who present at the Spanish market every year. And then there's a piece with um, Juanito Jimenez, who's a longtime Spanish market artist, Santero, and he uh, shows how to make natural pigment paints by going out to Abiquiu and collecting the pigments and how to, how to mix them. So there's a wide range of subjects and we're, we still have, you know, many people to film with. Uh, if, if there's any, you know, our limitations are, are that there are many of us, we don't have a lot of funding. And also the limitations are that many of these people are aging uh, and may pass before we have a chance to work with them. So one of the things we'd really like to do is train some young filmmakers uh, to continue and to film in their own traditional communities. So uh, this is all as a way of introducing the Wisdom Archive. And uh, to give you an introduction of what it actually looks like, I'd like to introduce a compilation piece we did, which is called Three Mornings in New Mexico, which includes uh, the beginnings of three films, The Last Shepherds, La Huerta de Don Bustos, and Los Comanches de la Serna. Please enjoy. My goodness, what a beautiful girl. There you go. Right on. I had one of what the Spantao is a dance honoring the combatants. The reason it's named is Spantao is because the dancers are to act like if they're scared of each other. Tino and Minnie, it's a girl and a guy, when they dance that dance, they dance from the heart. Oh, and that's a beautiful performance that those kids do. Some of our dancers, they come from distant places. Some come from California, some come from Las Cruces, and Albuquerque, and from all over, that have started when they were young, and it has been part of their life, so they set aside that day to be here. An empty day without a drum beat in our valley. It's so warming on New Year's Day. Even though it may be snowing or it may be very cold outside, but the drums, in my opinion, they warm up the hearts of many people in our community. And uh, I am one of those recipients, and I have been since I was a child. So it just resonates uh, beautiful memories of when I was a kid. And, uh, that's, that's what we do on New Year's Day.
I'll start to grind up some of this corn. Yeah, this is the old grinder we've been using for years. This is Camila's grandpa, can I? Grandma's, yeah. And grandma's. Yeah, we're still using it. It still, still works really, really well. That was a red chili that I grinded up before, so I, we use a grinder for everything. The first thing is we harvest the blue corn and we roast it on the oven to get that really nice smoky flavor. Hey, good morning, Emilio. What's happening, mijito? Huh? You doing good? Yeah. Good. Mm, what's nice is you've got the chili mixed in. I know, it's going to be a killer blend, man. It's, it's going to be, be really, really nice. It's a pretty color. It's nice to get started like this. And I remember Grandpa Bustos, and he'd get up, he'd have a little fire going. Grandma had a tea, a little atole for him. Yeah, this is my favorite part of the day. Salud. Salud. Thanks, sweetie. Thanks. Dawn's special blend. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's hot. Mm, it came out perfect. <laughs> Flame-throwing a toilet. Mm, no, man, it's just right. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Hey, Don. Bye, Emilio. Take care. Okay. Ya viene amaneciendo Sigo trabajando para mantener a lo que quiero tanto. Hey, tell me, we're walking the same steps our ancestors walked 400 years ago, you know. The curves, the same depth, everything's the same. It is so freaking awesome, huh? Same land produces food for 400 years, sustained our family and families in the community. It's, it's like, this is the just and right thing people should be doing. Not everybody's lifestyle, but people that choose it should be allowed to, to live it to its fullest. Oh no, this is cool. That's a piece of land that my ancestors farmed, huh? I can imagine them just doing the same thing you and I are doing. The same, same thing. That is so freaking cool, huh? pretty tough for just one person to take it to take it on I ask that question a lot 
What, what's going to happen? Oh, what yeah, are we going to do? Mommy asked that question all the time. What, what's going on? What's he, going on? He doesn't you don't like have to a hear. plan. You don't have a plan. He doesn't like to hear. And I don't. I don't like to hear. <laughs> Just go along. Your plan is kind of is developing itself in a sense with us along with it. In 1982, I think was, might have been the first year that we took him out to the forest. Cause that was when our oldest son was, I was expecting him. And we've been doing it, I guess, for about 32 years is how long we've been coming back and forth. It's just who I am. Yeah, even when the weather's bad and it's, even when it's bad, it's good. That's right. It brings back a lot of memories of the, what we used to do, bringing the cattle down and gathering in the fall. I have a book called Tough by Nature. It's written by some lady that spent 19 years um, interviewing women, ranch women, and drawing sketches and paintings of them and just a short interview. And there's one lady that said, if there's a woman that can pretty much do everything. It's because she had a dad that said, you can do whatever. And he didn't say, you're a girl, you can't do this. And that's us. This day is a stressful one because of all the traffic and dealing with the public. And I don't know if you saw how many how many cars we had lined up behind us there on the highway, but people enjoy seeing it because they used to see it a long time ago, and, and then we're the only ones that they see now. So we're the last of the Mohicans. Ya no más nos acabamos nosotros y se acabó parece. You never know. Somebody will decide they want to do it. I hope. And if they don't, pues se acaba. This is todo. Oh, it makes me feel honored and proud in many ways, but it also makes me sad that it's going to be gone. Que más te puedo decir? Uh, so, Scott, uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction to the Wisdom Archive and for participating here in our lecture series. The archive is truly a unique and informative resource, and I am glad you have been able to share it with our audience. Your video clips have provided us with a rich sampling of the work you, you and your team have done uh, for the archive like to uh, shortly open it up for a Q&A. For our audience, a reminder that you can type in any questions and comments on the lecture you may have into the chat room on the YouTube page from where you're viewing this presentation. As we await uh, for uh, any questions or comments, so let me start with, uh, with one or two uh, to get things rolling. Uh, Scott, how did you get happen to become interested in this particular project uh, in order to document and preserve Hispanic traditional skills and life ways in New Mexico? Uh, well, in uh, 1978, when I, I went to film school in Santa Fe at the Anthropology Film Center, uh, I was, uh, it, that's when I first got the idea. And I thought, wow, there's so much incredible traditional culture that's still happening here in northern New Mexico. And the issue at that time was, is that we were making films in 16 millimeter and it was expensive. 12 minutes of film with the sound and everything is, is uh, about a thousand dollars. And so if you wanted to do a film like The Last Shepherds, The Last Shepherds, there's probably, uh, oh, about a thousand hours of work and about, um, 
80 hours of footage that went into that film oh, and filming over many times, it would have been impossible to do. It was so hard to get funding. Uh, and especially that amount of funding that as a result, uh, it was impossible to do any filming uh, at that time with uh, elders or, or uh, traditional knowledge cameras. And uh, so when I returned in 2013, obviously cameras now are smaller. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot fewer people left uh, who, who are bearers of this knowledge, uh, but it seemed like, you know, no time like the present. So that's when we started. That's wonderful. Uh, we have a question from uh, the chat. Uh, how do you decide uh, what specific topics to focus on? Uh, well, it needs to be uh, generally an elder. It needs to be someone who has knowledge that they're still uh, able to show, uh, to, to actually show how to do it, because we're focusing on practical knowledge. Um, Frankly, it needs to be someone who we like and they like us so we get along and uh, because often it means spending quite a bit of time together uh, and mutual respect is a big part of that. I think another part that's changed over time is obviously I'm an outsider for much of this. And so there's been questions of trust. And I think there's enough films uh, in the archive now that people can see that our approach uh, is uh, we, we don't uh, put narration on top of anything. We don't uh, interpret anything. We let people speak for themselves. And the whole idea is to focus on the master and not on ourselves or on the film. We try and be as transparent as we can um, and, and preserve as much as we can of, of what these people are still doing. Now, I was particularly struck by your efforts to identify and preserve film records, which document these his, uh, Hispanic practices, and many of which I, I sense uh, were, were came out of uh, families just for uh, doing, um, you know, recording uh, these things for their own interest. Uh, can you expand on uh, how that part of the project has been uh, uh, has been going, and if if and, and uh, any any plan uh, any any particular projects that uh, will be coming down the pipe related to this? Well, uh, you know, I'm hoping to find some more uh, footage or old films that exist in archives in New Mexico archives. Uh, one of the great things to do, one of the reasons I'm very thankful to the museum and yourself for doing this lecture, it gives us a way to reach out to people in the community. And if you happen to have footage of an elder uh, in your family showing how to do something, um, that's the kind of stuff that we want to find. Funding is always difficult to find to put these films together. Um, one, one of our, our big focuses is trying to find uh, new filmmakers from traditional communities so that they can film in their own communities, not as outsiders as we are, but as insiders. Uh, and the issue there really is that, uh, as you know, in New Mexico, most of the focus is on the feature film industry. That's where the money is. That's where you can get a job and actually get paid. And we totally understand that documentary, it's a hard way to make a living. So we want to start a uh, kind of a competitive film program where uh, people apply uh, to get funded to make a film with an elder in their community, or they, it could be making a film with footage that they have. Uh, where we would have a stipend, uh, a payment of, let's say, $2,500, and then we would have uh, one of the people on our, in our group, ideally probably Chris or Lucia, who both have extensive experience teaching in uh, university, act as mentors for them to help them realize uh, a really good film about their elders. So that's something we're, we're, we're trying to raise funding for and to make competitive so that whatever comes out of it are films either that we can use or, or as I was saying earlier, if it is, sometimes there's a line between traditional knowledge and the sacred. And this is very clear in Native American communities. And if there's some knowledge that's sacred, but the people who hold it are passing, we'd be happy also to train people from that community to film with that elder for a film just to be used in their community, not to be put on the wisdom archive and out on YouTube. And uh, if folks are interested in, uh, in reaching out to you, I assume the best way is to contact you by the webpage. And the... Yeah, 
Uh, well, uh, yeah, so we have a webpage, thewisdomarchive.com, and then we have the Utah, YouTube channel, which is called The Wisdom Archive, uh, or it's scott at thewisdomarchive.com. If you, uh, also, if you know an elder uh, who you think is deserving of a film, and especially if you have the wherewithal to sponsor uh, the making of a film about that person, you know, we'd love to hear about you, or, or to sponsor a, a young filmmaker, uh, in the mentorship program. That would also be wonderful. So both of those, you can also contact me through the wisdomarchive.com. Wonderful. The, um, you mentioned in your talk, you referred to the, to, to the support that you all provided uh, uh, to the Folk Art Museum in developing its ongoing exhibit on Music Buena, Hispanic Music in New Mexico. Can you share any other projects uh, ongoing or planned that you're working on with the archive? And for it? Well, um, mostly we're, we're trying, <laughs> up to this point, most of our funding has been, we've been self-funded. We've had a few um, uh, donors in the community uh, as we're a 501c3. Uh, and so our limitations are that we're not very many people. We don't have much money and the elders are passing and we're getting older. <laughs> so uh, we don't have as much time or energy as uh, we might like to, to film with as many deserving people as there are. Uh, so again, that brings me back to the whole reason for trying to train younger filmmakers is so we have more bandwidth to cover more people and to have that done as soon as possible because people passing so quickly, especially during COVID. So um you know, there's another film which I'm hoping to, to do start soon, which is about a traditional um, tin worker uh, who uh, also works with a lot of young children and trains them. And that's always a big part of what we try and do is, is film with people who are training young people behind them so that they're leaving a legacy behind them. And that's kind of what the, the Wisdom Archive is. It's also designed to be a, a legacy for people. We have a comment from one of our uh, uh, participants. Um, he says, I assume you know And Now Miguel, which is now on the YouTube. Yeah, I, I do know about that film. I've seen it. It's a great movie. Uh, in some ways, maybe it would fit on the Wisdom Archive, except that it was made with the, you kind of see it at the end of the film, kind of the express intent of uh, getting people in the traditional Hispanic community uh, to volunteer to fight. This was during and before the Second World War. And that's somewhat problematic to me. Uh, there is some great uh, traditional stuff in that, but the overall uh, funding of it and the direction that the film goes, I have a problem with. If we could take that film and take out the part which focuses on the traditional knowledge, that would be great. That would be a great project. So I think that pretty much concludes our questions. Uh, Scott, do you have any last comments before we close things up? Mostly uh, just to thank you and uh, Billy Garrett, the director of the museum, and uh, uh, for the opportunity to come on and, and talk to people, show a little bit of our work, and uh, to let the people who were actually watching this now or who are gonna watch it later uh, on YouTube, uh, that the for whatever reason with Zoom and everything else, the actual quality of our films is somewhat higher than the way it appeared. Uh, it's not jerky and it's not fuzzy. So if you go to the website or you go to our YouTube channel, I think you'll be pretty pleased with the quality of the film. So um, please um, watch the films, subscribe to the YouTube channel and tell as many of your friends as possible. And, and if any of you happen to know or are a writer or you happen to know someone with local media. Uh, we've been doing this for seven years and we have not had a single article done about us or any of the films or any of the people in the films. That would be nice. It would be nice for people to know what we're doing and to get more people to watch. Uh, indeed it will. And uh, hopefully uh, sharing of this video will, uh, will, will help in some small part. Uh, again, and Scott, I wanna thank you again, of course, for, for discussing you know, the Wisdom Archive with us for sharing its goals and highlighting the work you and your team have done to date and have planned for the future. We wish you every success. Thanks, Ben. 
As a reminder to our audience, don't forget to check Scott's webpage, uh, thewisdomarchive.com. In closing, a reminder to everyone that you can rewatch this and other presentations of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series on our webpage, friendsofhistorynm.org. If you wish to learn more about upcoming lectures or to learn more about the Friends of History, we urge you to join our mailing list if you have not already done so, either via our webpage or by emailing us uh, at nmhmfriendsofhistory at gmail.com. As well, if, uh, if we, we certainly encourage you to make a donation. Uh, which helps both us, the Friends of History for this series, and other museum programs uh, at, at the History Museum. We look forward to seeing you all again in the months ahead as we continue uh, the first Wednesday lecture series. Goodbye for now. <laughs>